As Jesus came out of the wilderness uh, to start his public ministry, he'd been tempted by the devil and resisted it with the word of God and he was anointed by the Holy Spirit. He came out of that place of wilderness, came into his hometown of Nazareth and went up to the synagogue where he was handed the scroll of Isaiah. And he scrolled to the place where it says in Isaiah 61, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me to proclaim good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, to release the oppressed, recovery of sight for the blind, to declare the year of the Lord's favour. And so we come around the word of a God who was sent into chaos, <laughs> I was in this world. And when he came into this world, he came with the desire to set things right. He came with the Holy Spirit's anointing and enabling to fulfill his mission to be the justice giver. And so I want to jump straight in this morning with some things to remember about this justice giver. Some things to remember. The first thing that I feel that God wants us to remember this morning is that he is in charge. God is in charge. We see that all the way through the Proverbs. It talks about that he notices, that he sees, that he will take up the cause of the oppressed, of people who are forgotten and overlooked. It talks about that continually in Proverbs. And we've been doing this series foolproof, which means looking at what the Bible has to say about wisdom. We've been learning that wisdom is applied knowledge, not just what we know, but actually living it out. And so the proverb speaks to us to remember the justice giver and to remember that God is in charge. God is in charge. In Proverbs 24, 19 to 20, it says, Do not fret because of evildoers or be envious of the wicked. For the evildoer has no future hope, and the lamp of the wicked will be snuffed out. Pretty strong words. But God is in charge. And so because of this, the Bible says, do not fret. And I was thinking, that's an interesting word, fret. I sort of assumed it was like worry. But in the Bible, fret is a little bit different to worry. Fret is actually to be grieved, troubled, displeased, so much so that something eats away at you. When you see something that's not right, <laughs> do not fret because of evildoers or be envious of the wicked. Do you know there's a statement by Oswald Chambers where he says, all our fret and worry is caused by calculating without God. You now, I just want to put a little disclaimer in there because sometimes worry and anxiety is caused by someone who's struggling with symptoms of mental illness. So if you're here today and you've had a sustained period of anxiety or low mood and you can't shake it and it's just you've lived with it for a while, <laughs> can I just encourage you to seek some support that you're not alone? Sometimes we can't just turn it off by ourselves. We actually need to seek support from a, someone you trust, someone in your family, someone who's... A, perhaps here at church, that you trust. Because sometimes we need to actually get some extra help or seek out medical advice for things like that. So I'm not talking about that, right? I'm just putting that qualification there. <laughs> but he's saying all of our fret and worry, so much of it comes back to calculating without God. What if? What could? What might be? In Philippians verse 4, 6 and 7 in the message, it says, Don't fret or worry. There's that word again. Instead of worrying, pray. Let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers, letting God know your concerns. Before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, everything coming together for good, will come and settle you down. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. To displace something is to take the role of something. <laughs> to
to take over the place or the position or the role of something. So if Christ displaces worry in your life, he takes over the place and the position and the role of you being in control, which is actually good because you're not. News break. (laughs) In control. He is in control because he is God. Worry often stems from fearing a lack of control or fearing circumstances we can't control. And so that's why it's so important to feed our faith, to come around God's word, come to church regularly, to sit under the ministry of his word and to be reminded. When we focus on who Jesus is and what he's done, our faith capacity is fed. I sensed it this morning. Sam got up here. Yen was leading us, they're both being led of the Holy Spirit to feed our faith as they're singing or speaking out the word of God and what is true, faith starts to rise in our hearts. We start to remember who Jesus is and what he's done. And everyone here today, God is spiritually feeding you through his word. He's feeding your faith capacity to trust Jesus. That's why sitting under the ministry of his word is so powerful, so important. And in Hebrews 12, verse 1 to 3, it says, In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets and at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he also made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. God has spoken to you by his son. He's speaking to you by his son here today. Jesus is God's message to you. Whatever you're facing this morning, whatever life looks like for you right now, Jesus is God's message to you. And it says in that verse that that Jesus is the exact representation of, he's exactly like God. When we look at Jesus, we see up close and personal, we see in human form who God is and what he's like. In the Amplified verse The end of verse 3 says, When he himself and no other had, by offering himself on the cross as a sacrifice for sin, accomplished purification from sins and established our freedom from guilt, he sat down. Some of you need to have that picture right now. God is not anxiously pacing about your life. He's not looking at his watch going, He sat down. At the right hand of the Father, revealing his completed work at the right hand of the majesty on high and revealing his divine authority. The right hand in the Bible is a symbol of closeness, proximity to the king. It's also a symbol of power and authority being delegated to someone. He sat down. God is not anxiously pacing about your life. He's reigning and ruling. He sat down. He's seated on the throne. He sent the Holy Spirit to come and live in your life, to work within you. He's not surprised or shocked by what you are going through or facing right now. He's seated on the throne. Evil might look like it's winning in this world or in our culture or in your circumstance, but it's not. God is in charge, seated on the throne, the righteous one. And you can ask him to open the eyes of your heart. Say, God, where are you working in my life? What are you trying to do in this situation? I've been looking at it from just Everything's going wrong, but Lord, you show me what it is that you want me to see in this situation, what it is that you want to show me about who you are and what you're doing in my life. People who do evil might look like they're flourishing, but this life is not all there is. And that proverb said, the wicked have no future hope, their lamp will be snuffed out. That's pretty serious. (laughs) Eternity is real. Proverbs reminds us evildoers have no hope. No future hope. 
And the Bible is clear on this. People who persist in doing wrong and do not change their mind and receive God's forgiveness offered through Jesus will not inherit eternal life. There will come a day when all of us will stand before Jesus, the righteous judge, all of us. And if we don't also know him as our personal Lord and (laughs) Saviour, then we too will be asked to give an account of our own sinful thoughts and wrongdoing. And the very real punishment for sin, our independence from God, the wages, the payment for sin, the Bible says, is death, being cut off from God and all that is good forever. And we don't like sometimes to talk about hell, but Jesus spoke about hell a lot when you read the Gospels. It's a place that is far from God and all that is good. J.I. Packer says, Scripture sees hell as self-chosen. Hell appears as God's gesture of respect for human choice. All receive what they actually choose, either to be with God forever worshipping him or without God forever worshipping themselves. But the good news is it doesn't actually have to be this way for you (laughs) and for the people that we tell about the good news about Jesus. Because while there's breath in your lungs, while your heart is beating, there's an opportunity for you to respond to this free message of grace that Jesus loves you and he took the punishment for your sin, not his own. He took it. He willingly took the punishment for all. You think of all the evil, all the things that have ever been done wrong ever upon this earth. Jesus took that upon himself willingly. He became sin for us. He was actually separated, abandoned from God the Father. He was dead for, like dead, dead, dead for three days, buried in the grave. But he's not dead now. (laughs) He's alive. We sang about it this morning. That's the best news ever because he wants every person to have an opportunity to hear about Jesus. He wants every person to have an opportunity to receive him personally into their life to know him and worship him forever. And he didn't just take the punishment for our sin, but he offers us adoption into God's family as his kids. That's amazing. He did it for us and he did it for free and it's something we can't earn and it's the best thing ever. But I I know the room's gone quiet. (laughs) It reminds us of the urgency and the seriousness of sharing our faith. That he wants to work through us because he loves people. He doesn't want anyone to be separated from him for eternity. Now, it doesn't mean that there's no consequences for wrongdoing or evil or injustice perpetrated on others in this life. No, it does not. God cares about justice now on this earth. Some people who receive Christ will go on to live the rest of their lives in prison for crimes they've committed. And this is right and just. But they can know and experience Jesus too and have a future hope (laughs) forever. Have a look at this picture. I don't know if any of you remember this man, but his story moved me so deeply. This is Andrew Chan. Do you remember him? In 2015, he and his friend, just got to get his name right, Mayuran Sakumaran, were convicted for drug trafficking in Bali and 10 years after they were arrested, they were executed by an Indonesian firing squad as the death penalty for their crimes. Chan became a Christian while in prison and led the English language church service. In reconciling his death sentence with his faith in God, in 2013, while in custody, he said, When I got back to my cell, I said, God, I ask you to set me free, not kill me. (laughs) God spoke to me and said, Andrew, I have set you free from the inside out. I have given you life. From that moment on, I haven't stopped worshipping him. I'd never sung before, never led worship until Jesus set me free. And when facing the firing squad, Chan, Sukumaran and the other seven prisoners refused to be blindfolded. They sang Amazing Grace and stood there knowing that they were going to be with Jesus forever. And I remember watching it on the news and it's so moving me. (laughs) 
Because Christ had displaced worry and fear and sin and evil at the centre of Andrew Tan's life. And he was a man transformed. So much so that he spent 10 years in prison doing as much good to his fellow prisoners as possible. He taught English classes and other vocational courses. He mentored other prisoners. He deepened his biblical knowledge and grew in his faith. He led others in worship. He led others to Christ. He was executed for his crimes. Now, I personally think the death penalty is horrendous (laughs) and I oppose it. Some people would say this was justified. But the way he faced death proved that he knew where he was going and that the great hope he had for his future had begun because he'd received Christ. And because he had Jesus, although his freedom was limited, his actual physical life was taken from him on this earth, because he had Jesus, he had everything. If you look at this picture, the next one, it's a picture of his wife. He married her 24 hours before he was shot. She was a pastor that went into the prison to visit him and they got married. And then this last picture, that's the Catholic priest. He was ministering to them moments before they were led out to be killed. You know, we sing that song, no guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, who? Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. Jesus is life itself. If we have him, we have an eternal hope that can never be taken from us and we can remember that God is in charge. That's a word for some of you this morning. God is in charge. God is in charge. He's seated on the throne. He's reigning. He's ruling. We also need to be reminded about the justice giver, that God is the source of justice. God is the source of justice. Sometimes we can look to people and think, if only this happened, or if this came through for me, or if this person apologised, or if this was made right, then I would receive justice. In Proverbs 29, 26, it says, Many seek an audience with a ruler, but it is from the Lord that one gets justice. If you're seeking justice, if something that's happened is, has happened to you that is not right and right needs to be made wrong, look to Jesus. Because there's this story that Jesus tells in the Gospels. It's a parable and he talks about this widow. She had no other way of getting help. She had no way other family who were advocating for her in something that happened that was not right. But there was an unjust judge who lived in this village and he didn't fear God, didn't have any respect for God really didn't care about people but this widow was so persistent probably so annoying to him (laughs) she kept going to him and asking for justice she kept coming back she'd kept coming back like he'd probably lift open the door and there she was again (laughs) and Jesus tells this story because he says look this judge was unjust but eventually because this lady was bothering him so much because she wouldn't give up because she was persistent in pleading with him and asking for justice to be done, the judge eventually gave her what she wanted, (laughs) gave her justice in this situation, gave her what was right. And then he goes on to say, listen to what the unjust judge says. You can read what he says before that. He says, because this woman widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice. And then he says, so that she eventually won't come and attack me. <laughs> Obviously, she was feeling a little bit desperate. <laughs> he was worried that she was going to beat his door down and go a little bit, get a bit violent on him. I don't know. I th- I'd never seen that before. I thought that was quite interesting. But then, And then the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God, the just judge... Bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day 
and night. Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Because it takes faith to keep persisting when something is not right. It takes faith to keep looking to God and say, God, bring justice in this situation. It takes faith to be persistent. That's a word for you, Yen. Going over next year, it takes faith to be persistent and say, Lord, bring justice in this situation. Yen's going overseas. Um, We're going to farewell Lewis and Yen in January. She's going to work for a year voluntarily for International Justice Mission as a lawyer, looking to prosecute people for crimes against kids, sexual crimes against children. It's going to be a challenging word. We need to work. We need to pray for her. But that's a word for you. He will see that they get justice and quickly. Faith, you've got to keep exercising faith. Some of you have sort of given up. Don't give up. Keep asking God. Say, God, would you move in this situation? You've promised that I'm one of your chosen ones. I've received you. You've promised that you will give me justice and quickly. The third thing that I think God wants us to remember, yes, he wants us to remember that he's in charge, that he's the source of justice, but also that he knows what's going on. We are so good at thinking we can hide stuff from God. Maybe we just think we can hide it from ourselves, but he knows what's going on. In Proverbs 28, 14, it says, Blessed is the one who always trembles before God, has a reverent respect for God, but whoever hardens their heart falls into trouble. And that hardening of hearts, how does it happen? I think it happens when we deliberately go against our conscience, when the Holy Spirit's bringing something to our conscience and we're just like, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. I don't want to hear that right now. (laughs) When we convince ourselves that it doesn't really matter. All right, I'm going to tell you a story about (laughs) Sophie. Um. A couple of weeks ago, I was driving and I was preoccupied by something and I looked down, I was inattentive and I gently nudged the back of this lady's car. And I was like, oh, great, guess what a loser. Like, you know how you just get annoyed at yourself and start... Anyway, I was doing that. Because I may, I was very embarrassed, I was angry and disappointed in myself. I was not looking forward to a conversation with my husband because I may have had one or two of those conversations with him in previous years. And I was really trying to work on my attentiveness. Um, none of you relate to that, of course. You're all like perfect drivers. <laughs> but my conscience was in overdrive. (laughs) So off I go, this lady pulls out, and I'm thinking, no one's around. Like, this little thought went into my head, you know, who would even know if I didn't pull over? And I thought, Cass, how could you think that? That's horrible. So I pulled off into the side street, and we exchanged details and did all that sort of stuff. And But I just thought, you know, God's watching. Hey, hey, I could have just, no one would have known. Driven off, off I go. Yeah, everything's fine. Just straighten out the whatever at the bottom. My conscience wouldn't let me, went into overdrive. And then when I got home, I'm thinking, I really don't want to have this conversation. How do I have this conversation? So I'm like sitting there going, oh, Jesus. <laughs> sitting there, like, and then finally I'm like, it's like I couldn't hold it in. It's like God would not let me, my conscience rest until I actually said to Michael, I need to talk to you about the car. <laughs> And we had a conversation, and I apologise because it was my fault and I did the wrong thing. Um, I tell you all that because there's times in your life where you know God is working on your conscience, right? Yes? (laughs) And sometimes we can, just because we worry about the consequences or we worry about what people think or we're just like, oh, I did it again. You know, we can... We can just put it off and push it off. It's so easy to do that. And no one would know. No one would know. But God knows. And I've resolved that I want to live in a way that delights the heart of God. Because I love him. And so when he starts to move upon my conscience, I know he's not doing it to try and, well, you're a loser. and you're, Yes, you are. And you're a bad person. All that sort of stuff. I know he's doing it because he actually wants me to walk in the light and to be a person of truth and integrity because that is who he is. (laughs) 
In Proverbs 10.9, it says, Whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but whoever takes crooked paths will be found out. In Proverbs 23.10-11, to 11, it says, Do not move an ancient boundary stone or encroach upon the fields of the fatherless. For their defender is strong. He will take up their case against you. God sees and he knows. 1 John 8... Sorry, 1 John 1, 8 to 10 says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. And so maybe your conscience right now is the Holy Spirit's just reminding you some stuff. He's not doing it to go, you're awful, I hate you. <laughs> he loves you. He's wanting you to bring it to your, to your mind so that you can confess it to him and then that he can extend to you and remind you that he's forgiven you already <laughs> and that you can walk in his light as he is light and that you don't need to align yourself or your heart with areas of darkness because Satan is the father of lies. God is truth. He wants us to walk in truth. And so that verse says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We cannot claim to be without sin when our conscience is going overdrive. If we do, we only deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We ignore our conscience. We actually dull ourselves to hearing God's voice. We cannot claim we have not sinned Because if we do, John says, we make God out to be a liar and his word is not in us. It's pretty strong words, right? But as people who are set apart for Jesus, we're meant to reflect him and be people who walk in integrity. Remember, wisdom is applied knowledge. It's actually responding to the Lord as he moves upon our conscience and saying, God, I did stuff up. I did make a mistake. I wasn't paying attention when I was driving here. (laughs) I need your help. (laughs) I need to right a wrong. I need to say sorry. I need to apologize. I need to take responsibility. But you need to know this morning, if there's something that you need to do business with, that Jesus doesn't condemn you. He loves you. And he wants you to bring it into the light so he can help you make it right. The final thing that I believe the Lord wants to remind us, yes, he's in charge. Yes, he is the source of justice. Yes, he knows everything. (laughs) He knows everything about what's going on in our lives. But the final thing I feel like he wants to remind us this morning is that justice is so much bigger than we think. Because when we think of the word justice, often we think about murder and theft and how the law says those things are wrong and society says those things are wrong and the Bible says those things are wrong. And we think about our justice system, which is fantastic and it's designed to outwork and administer God's justice. To see that there is appropriate measures where people are tried for crimes that they're committed of and then if they're found guilty that they're sentenced and they're either sent to jail or there's some other appropriate measure of justice we think of that automatically but when the bible describes justice it also includes a broader set of actions that are fueled by god's compassion and generosity towards people who are vulnerable poor overlooked or oppressed justice is so much bigger than we think (laughs) tim keller uh, a fantastic author and um writer and pastor says this if you are trying to live in accordance with the bible the concept and call to justice are inseparable we do justice when we give all human beings their due as creations of god that's why dignity is one of our core values that all people are created in the image of god and have worth in his eyes and are loved by jesus he gave his life for them we treat people with dignity We are a church for all people. Doing justice includes not only the righting of wrongs, but generosity and social concern, especially towards the poor and the vulnerable. I want you to have a look at some photos 
Sorry, Marge. You sent me some photos and I want to talk, talk about them. I hope you're okay with that. <laughs> because I want to bless you and honour you. Have a look at these handbags. There's a beautiful group of women in our church, in our life group, Leslie Turner's life group, Joan Highland and Marge Litwin, and I know many others, have been involved in buying handbags from secondhand shops or donating handbags. They put some beautiful cosmetics in them, new, brand new. They attach a little card with a note. They pray over each one. And then it gets delivered to women's shelters, women who have been struggling or come out of a situation with domestic violence. Isn't that awesome? She told me about that last week and I'm like, this is amazing. If you have got a drawer full of cosmetics, they have to be new. Don't give them used ones. That's just gross. They have to be new. <laughs> All right? But if you have got a whole, give them to March. Or if you have got some, she wants big handbags, not the little mini ones. If you've got big handbags that can fit stuff in them, they're new, they're beautiful, they look nice, give them to March. Their group is actually collecting this. It costs about $40 to fill a handbag. And to be able to put that in the hands of a woman and say, you are of incredible worth. You are not forgotten and overlooked. God has, you know, inspired us to want to reach out to you and just say you're special. You're made in his sight. How awesome is that? Imagine if other life groups found something like that, that God would just give them an idea or inspire them to do something. Isn't that cool? Man, Marge, I reckon you're going to have a whole lot of cosmetics coming your way. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Have a look at these scriptures. Deuteronomy 10, 18 says, He, God, defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing. Psalm 112, 5 says, Good will come to those who are generous and lend freely, who conduct their affairs with justice. Proverbs 19, 17 says, Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord. And he will reward them for what they have done. Justice is so much bigger than we think and we can have a part to play in outworking justice. How do we do that? Well, when you see a need, act justly. <laughs> do something. God brings people and situations across your life every day of every week. So when that happens and you're arrested by something, you notice something, you notice a need, don't look away and think it's someone else's job. It's not. It's yours. Act justly. Think about how you could do something. Yeah, you can't do everything. We know that. God knows that you can't do everything. Man, there's so much injustice in the world. But you can do something. Am I right? You can do something. Tim Keller again says, if a person has grasped the meaning of God's grace in his or her heart, he or she will do justice. If they don't live justly, then they may say with their lips that they're grateful for God's grace, but in their heart they are far from him. If they don't care about the poor and reveals that at best they don't understand the grace they've experienced and at worst they have not really encountered the saving mercy of God. Grace should make you just. Grace should make you just. And there's lots of ways. If you don't know where to start, we have Hampers of Hope. We have One in Ten. We have CFC Kids Breakout. Last week, we picked up 10 kids from our, or about eight kids from our community. We had 10 new kids, six. We had six kids give their life to Christ for the first time, including an adult who came to bring a child, recommit their life to Jesus. Man, we want to we, we pray and believe for more buses next year. Our youth this year have been stirred to give towards um, homeless youth and raise money, sell clothing. Like God is stirring something in our church. He's stirring something for us to be a community that actually reaches out with his justice. Maybe he's given you an idea today. Maybe it's confirmed an idea that you've had. Maybe you need to make an appointment with me or Sam or someone. Come and say, hey, I've had this idea. And it's not either or. It's not just showing Jesus care and compassion 
and zipping our lips. It's showing Jesus care and compassion and then being so compelled by the love of God and so ready for an opportunity that we share and tell about Jesus, the one who has inspired us into action, propelled us into action. In Micah 6 verse 8, it says, He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Justice is bigger than we think. Wisdom is applied knowledge. Now that you know what you know, now that we've been reminded that God cares deeply about justice, Act justly. Right where you find yourself this week, who is it who's outside the doors of your home, who is forgotten, overlooked? Who is it that's outside the doors of your work or in your work that God wants you to act justly towards? Who is it who's outside the walls of this church that we need to act justly, do justly to? We're going to pray. Let's do that now. We remember you, Jesus. We thank you that you are the ultimate example of someone who acted justly, who acted justly. Because in Isaiah 59, it says, The Lord looked and was displeased. He was appalled that there was no justice. He saw that there was no one to intervene. So his own arm achieved salvation for him and his own righteousness sustained him. Jesus, we thank you that you took the initiative, that you saw the mess that we were in and you yourself came. You didn't stand afar and think they'll have to sort it out. You didn't literally say go to hell. You actually came (laughs) and gave your life on a horrendous cross. You became sin for us. You took it upon yourself so that you could act justly, so that you could make things right, so you could take the punishment for our sin. And we give you praise for that, God. We give you praise for that, Jesus. You are the justice giver and your heart beats and longs to reach and stretch out your hand to administer justice. And you do it through your body, through your bride, through your army, the church. And if you're here right now and you've never given your life to Jesus. You've never invited him to come into your life. You've heard today that eternity is real and you've never said, Jesus, I want to be with you for eternity. Today is the day that you can give your life to him. You just invite him in. Just start talking to him. Come into my life. Forgive me. I don't want to go my own way anymore, God. I want to go your way. Thank you for dying on a cross for me. Thank you for taking my punishment. Thank you that you want to help me live for you now. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Your promise of your presence is with me right now. Come into my life. I receive you, Jesus. I believe upon you. I put my trust in you.